so this is lecture 10 okay so before we proceed i want to point out one uh, a mistake that i made in last class which was as an oversight for m squared qam the average energy should be what uh, 2 times m squared minus 1 by 3 so there was a mistake there and uh, looks like enough of you have realized the mistake but and uh, make sure make sure that works out okay so there's a two factor that will flow from okay and uh, that's something to keep in mind okay so that's the uh, that's as far as this is concerned and uh, i want to spend some time in this class talking talking about this real passband uh, signal space and the corresponding complex baseband signal space it's, it's a little bit important because the way we uh, the way we will discuss for the rest of the class will mostly concern ourselves with real baseband and real passband no no uh, real passband but the real passband we won't view it with cos 2 pi f naught t and sin 2 pi f naught t and all that so we will view it completely in complex baseband and in complex baseband the signal space will be slightly different okay so i want to in the, in the sense the basis is different obviously but but the signal space in every, every other characteristic is exactly the same. So I want to spend some time just driving that through once again. So I'll just briefly summarize it for m squared QAM. So pretty much in the, for the rest of this close course, we'll be dealing with MPAM and m squared QAM. Okay? So I'll point out some other modulation schemes just for completeness, but we will not go into any details there. Okay? So if you're interested, you should read more about all these other modulations. This is, I think some people came and asked me about offset QPSK, pi by 4 QPSK, all these things. And then uh, there's also something called minimum shift keying, which is actually a modulation scheme with memory. Okay, So you do a lot of bits together, something called continuous phase modulation. All these things are uh, interesting ideas, but but just to be, just to, the area of digital communications that way can be very vast. Okay, So to simplify and do something in the first course, we will pretty much concentrate at MPAM and M squared QAM. Okay, so these are pretty much what's used today okay so any communication system you take will either use mpam or m squared qam okay, okay. so it's, it's it's what is uh, interesting for us so i limit myself to that but that doesn't mean there's nothing else out there please go and read up on your own you might get some you might get some uh, some things to uh, talk about all right so let me remind you of the of the signal space ideas and how you move from the real passband domain to the complex baseband domain okay so this is important it's important for several reasons and i'll try to point out all these things and the, all the equivalences that happen okay so I, I denoted a general point in the m squared qam as a complex number it's a two dimensional uh, space and you pick a point in it it's two real numbers you can think of it as a complex number for convenience okay so my signal point is a plus jb Okay, and there is a real passband signal corresponding to each signal point in my m squared qam constellation. What is that real passband signal? I called it XABT. Okay, so you can map it to in various different ways. The signs don't matter, but you'll see one A will multiply a cosine term and B will multiply a sine term. Okay, so that's important. A root 2 by t. Okay, what what this root 2 by t is not not too crucial. Okay, so I'm just I'm having it around for uh, normalization purposes. Like I said, in practice, the last thing you care about are these constants that multiply your signals. Those, those have no meaning in practice. Okay, so plus b root 2 by t sine 2 pi f naught t. Okay, all right, so this is between 0 to t, and that makes my bandwidth rather large. Okay, so for the first cut in the initial system that we are going to look at, I'm going to say around f naught. I'll assume I have a large bandwidth and that is a problem we'll fix later. Okay, So we'll say we'll fix that later. Right now we'll use a large bandwidth around F0. So once you do that, this is a passband real signal. Okay, So this is a real passband signal. Okay, For those of you who have already understood this, this might be the fourth or fifth time I'm repeating myself, but this is quite crucial and important. So maybe think about it more, you, you might get other facets of this which are interesting okay so real passband signal okay so how many of these signals do we have m squared of them one corresponding to each point in my m square qam constellation that's fine so you take all those signals and if you do gram smith on them how many basis signals will you get 
2 one of them will be root 2 by t cos 2 pi f naught t between 0 and t and root 2 by t sin 2 pi f naught t between 0 and t okay but that's not how i design these signals how did i design the signal i did it in reverse i started with the basis and then picked my point on the space both are fine you can do both ways it will work out the same way okay so corresponding to this set of signals there is a two dimensional signal space over the real numbers okay signal space over r okay so what do i mean by this over r now okay so my basis is cos 2 pi f naught t sin 2 pi f naught t what is this over r business the lean the combination terms the linear the scaling factors will be real okay so in my 2d signal space the scaling factors are real right i multiply a real number with cos 2 pi f naught t and another real number with sin 2 pi f naught t so i have a 2d signal space over the real numbers okay so that's what this means okay so what's the basis here i've been talking about it a lot okay so i'll i'll write it up to a normalization factor okay if you want an orthonormal basis you have to multiply by root 2 by t to make it uh, so remember once again this is between 0 and t i'm restricting myself to 0 and t and that's the way i'm fixing my bandwidth okay so this is how it's working out okay my, my bandwidth is becoming very large and it's, it's working that way okay all right so an arbitrary signal is obtained by multiplying these things and all this is fine okay so this is a this is a good picture and we've been happy with it the basis is cos 2 pi of naught t sin 2 pi of naught t and if you want to do what would you do at the receiver if this is what you thought of as your signal what would you do at the receiver you'll correlate with the basis vectors okay so one easy way of correlating with cosine and sine is to use this lc circuits right i, I described it hopefully you understand it you, all, all you need is some circuit whose impulse response is a sinusoid and lc is a good circuit for that so you can use an lc circuit tuned to f naught okay some one by root lc has to be close some f naught and then you tune it that way and then you can use it directly and correlate directly in real pass band it's possible there's nothing wrong with that one can do that okay so it's possible to design such receivers also okay so correlation will be in you can do pass band correlation if you want okay so that's definitely possible that's there okay but the way the another way to view this is to view the picture in complex base band okay so which changes a lot of things and gives you a different kind of a system to implement it what do i do I take this real passband signal and then do a down conversion. When I do a down conversion, I see that the complex envelope of X A B of T, okay, all those complex envelopes together also form a signal space. On that, I can do Gram-Schmidt again. Okay, so that's the picture that you should have in mind. So suddenly your basis will change. Okay, that's because you have done a down conversion from the real passband picture to the complex baseband picture. Okay, so what did we do next? We took this, we took this x a b of t. Okay, I'm not writing it down fully, which has real and pass band, and we do a down conversion. Okay, remember you can also go back and do by an up conversion, right? So this down conversion is a, a is a re reversible process. So it's fine. You do a down conversion and you get what? Your complex envelopes. Okay, how many of these complex envelopes do you have? Again, m squared of them, one corresponding to each a plus j b. But this complex envelope is very, very simple. Okay, if you normalize it and write it properly, it will work out as a plus j b times root 1 by t between 0 and t. Okay, is that clear? So the complex envelope is simply, well, maybe this is a root, root 2 factor or something. I'm normalizing it. Okay, don't worry about it. I just want to have root 1 by t there I'll, I'll say you i'll say why you have it maybe you think of it as a minus jb but it doesn't matter maybe i change these things so these signs are not too crucial if you want i'll write a minus jb it's just if you're too particular about the exactness of the mathematical formulation i'll write a minus jb it's okay okay so this is what we had okay now if you take all these a x a b tildes and do gram smith over c okay with 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 uh, complex vector spaces okay you'll see you will get only one basis okay what will be that basis just root 1 by t between 0 and t okay so these guys this signal space is a 1d signal space over over what c not the real numbers over the complex numbers what is the basis 
basis is simply root 1 by t. It's just a constant function between 0 and t. Okay. So you understand the subtle switch that has happened. You're dealing with the real passband signal and you get a two-dimensional signal space over R. Then you do a down conversion, view it as a complex signal and you do Gram-Schmidt, you get only a one basis. Okay, So that's why in the picture that I drew, I said once you down convert, your correlator is nothing but a integrate and dump. Okay, But you have to do two integrates and dumps on two signals, one for the I channel, one for the Q channel. Okay, So that's enough. Okay. So that was a that's a different way of viewing the exact same thing. You're just doing processing in a different way. Okay, so this picture should be very clear to you. So once I go to so so this one-dimensional signal space over C also has the same type of picture. If you want to draw the picture, you have to draw the same picture because it's complex numbers, right? So just because you have one dimension, since it's complex, all these A plus JBs will have the same picture. The picture won't change, but what has changed? The basis you have to think of it as just one basis vector. Every complex number is multiplying that basis vector. Okay, so this is a crucial picture. I'm going to draw this entire picture once again, and then uh, we'll go through it maybe quickly. Okay, so I have two times log m base two bits. Okay, these things go through my what are called bit to symbol converter. It's also called a mapper. Okay, you map and you get two guys out. Okay, so this is a plus j b. Okay is also my vector x, this is x1, this is x2, right? This is how I think about my, uh, think about my, uh, uh, my signal, okay? It's actually a vector. Okay, then once I have this a plus jb, I'm going to go through a discrete to continuous time transformation. Okay, I'll say d to a, okay? So I take my a plus jb and what do I do? What do I do to get my x a b tilde? What do I do? I simply repeat the A. Just I just hold the A for a capital T time interval. Okay, so well, you might say the root one by T. I have to multiply, but <laughs> you wouldn't multiply by such things. Okay, so that those things are taken care of elsewhere. So you just take this A and hold it for a time T. Take the B, hold it for a time T. So that's what you did to get x A B tilde. For the next time interval, maybe you switch it, you change it to something else. Okay, so that's fine. So once you have x A B tilde, what do you do? You do a up conversion to go to the required frequency. Once you do the up conversion, you have your real passband signal. Okay, so you have just one line there, which is a real passband signal. Okay, so when you transmit the way we model it, say it goes through a channel. For us, the channel is okay. We have assumed the channel has a large enough flat bandwidth around F0, so this XAB is going to come through harmless. There is no channel component. Okay, so it's going to come through without any problems, and the only thing that will happen to it is a noise process, an AWJ noise process is going to get added to it. So once I do that, I get R. Well, I don't want to say R A B now. So yeah, maybe I'll say R A B. It's okay. So it's just an illustration. R A B of T. Okay, which is my received signal corresponding to X A B of T. Okay. So there are two possibilities now. If you want to correlate in pass band, you could correlate in pass band as well. Okay, but maybe those things are tough to build. They're not stable. There's so many problems are there. So maybe you want to bring it down to base band. But you can do either one. There are systems where people do correlation in pass band also. It might be at the end of the day a simpler circuit, right? It will consume lesser power. Maybe who knows? Okay. So you could correlate in pass band. If you correlate in pass band, what will you get? When you correlate your signals, you'll get y right the vector y you'll get y1 and y2 okay so that's one way of going about it so i'm not going to draw that here i'm not going to show that because that's not what what is typically done in communication systems you always down convert and then do your correlation and all that in fact there's also a low pass filtering that people will do okay whatever bandwidth that's of interest to you you first put a low pass filter on that bandwidth and make sure noise from elsewhere is not coming because you, you want to down convert and quickly sample in fact some people just directly sample passband signals. So if you want to do such things, you want to, right, I, I did I talk about passband sampling, maybe maybe you're familiar with this. So even if it's, as long as there's an integer multiple somewhere in the middle, you can passband sample. All you need to do is make sure the noise is not there out of band. Okay, So reject the out of band noise and passband sample also. So many models in which these things work. So that's why it's good to put a low pass filter. I'm not going to show the low pass filter as well. I'm directly going to write down 
a down converter okay so you do a down conversion to get the the complex envelope of the received signal okay so you get that so so in a pass band equivalent picture in the base band equivalent picture you can kind of ignore this part and view the complex envelope of rab as a noise corrupted version of xab okay it's possible to do that you can have a consistent model of the noise and it's possible to do that also okay so you can in fact say i will not even deal up, deal with any real pass band signal okay i don't want to worry about that at all i only want to worry about my complex base band signal and i'll do the modeling entirely with this also possible okay so then you do your correlation in base band okay for the simple case correlation is integrate and dump okay that's you do that you get your y okay this is your vector y y1 and y2 so these are the i and q channels so to speak okay so those are the two channels corresponding to y1 and y2 and then you run your detector to get back your say your x hat or bits okay so it's all the same it's just a one to one map you get this or that okay so, so there's lots of conversions happening here and hopefully you're familiar with you're, you're you're able to become familiar with this easily okay so it's it's, it's a little bit difficult to think of uh, what's happening if you're not if you're not used to this thing but eventually maybe towards the end of the course you'll be you'll become really really familiar with this okay so before we proceed further so from now on mostly we'll be worried about complex baseband and real baseband Okay, so we won't worry that much about this up conversion, down conversion, cos 2 pi f naught t, sin 2 pi f naught t, and all that. I'll pretty much con concern myself to concern myself with the base band. Okay, so and then pretty much deal with only the vector x and vector y. Okay, so you have to fill in all these pieces and understand that there are a lot of modifications possible to this block diagram itself. Okay? Right? In the first class, I said this course will be filled with block block diagrams. Okay, this is one of those block diagrams, and you can modify this in several ways, particularly at the receiver. And today, receivers are implemented. With different versions of this, and you should understand how the signals are flowing through, and all these things are possible. Okay, any questions on this? Comments? Yeah, 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 yeah. That won't change because it's down conversion is just shifting in frequency, right? So it won't change the noise statistic. So it will be the same. The correlation is what will make your noise discrete, and we showed what the correlation does. As long as it's orthogonal. Or in the complex case, there's only one thing you're correlating with, so you'll get only one noise. So you'll get a not right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. So. So so one more thing you have to convince yourself. Suppose I do correlation in pass band itself directly, I will directly get the exact same y. Okay. So remember, I'll get the exact same y. The y won't change. It'll be exactly the same, and my model is exactly the same. So this pass band base band is just a signal processing convenience. As far my as far as my vector model is concerned, it's the exact same vector model for both the pass band correlation as well as the base band correlation. But you see already why the base band correlation might be better, right? Right? It's in low frequency. You can do with processors. You can do digital. Like I said, many of these things are done digital today. Okay? So you just as soon as possible you sample and then work with numbers. Okay? So that's why a base band thing is better. Integrate and dump is simply addition. You just add. Add all the samples and divide, uh, compare suitably, and finally with the threshold. It's very, very easy to implement. Okay, any other question? It's fine. Okay. So, so that's the, that's the, that's the thing. And a few other assumptions. Okay, so a few other assumptions that are very important for this block diagram to work well. And if you start your building these things, these assumptions will come to kill you. The first assumption is. At least in this picture, I've assumed there's a lot of bandwidth around F0. You won't have that situation, so we'll have to modify that. At that time, when we modify, we'll go back and look at this block diagram and see how to go about doing it. That's one thing. The second crucial assumption is this F0 should be exactly available at the receiver. Okay, otherwise you can't down convert. Okay, so imagine what will happen. Suppose you have an error in F0 at the down converter. What will happen? Yeah. So, so you'll have an E par J2 pi delta F T. 
factor in your RAB tilde. Okay. So what? So what does that mean? So my real. Uh, so so I'll, I'll maybe we'll, we'll deal with this more in detail later. But I want to give you a hint of what will happen. Your constellation, your received constellation will start rotating with time, right? So right now your received constellation points are around your transmitted constellation points. In the received constellation, because of this delta F difference, you will have an E bar J delta F T factor. So your received complex number will start rotating. E bar J 2 pi delta F is a rotation, right? With time it will rotate. And actually you can see it. You can write some simple MATLAB code and easily simulate this and you'll see it. Or you can build a simple system which will demonstrate this for you. Okay? You can see the rotation. Start rotating. Okay? So, in, uh, so that's a critical assumption. Okay? So you have to make sure that F0 is available. There's one more critical assumption. What is that? Yeah, the T. Okay? So you should know the exact capital T. Okay? So that's also something... Well, it may, maybe capital T is not too critical. You don't have to be very exact with it, but you should know. You should have some knowledge of capital T. Where am I using the knowledge of capital T? In the correlator. Right? That's where I'm using it. Okay. So in the receiver, you should know both F0 and T. Okay. So the knowledge of F0 is called the coherent assumption. If you say I'm, I'm building a coherent receiver, it means I know my center frequency. Okay. It's also possible to build non-coherent receivers. Okay. Maybe if we have time, I'll go through it. But I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's possible to build non-coherent receivers and it's possible to have transmitters suitable for non-coherent receivers and all that. All that is there. Okay. The other notion, knowing capital T, is known as the timing recovery problem. Okay. How do you recover the timing? Okay. So timing is as in what time you're sending uh, the bits. Okay. So those two, those three problems, if we have time towards the end of the course, I'll go into. Okay. Those are more. Those are more, those are less theoretical and more practical in nature. Those kind of problems, you fix them with a lot of other, in so many other ways. Okay, so that's why we'll we'll sort of see them later. All right, any other comments or questions? Something's just disturbing you. Anything you think is worth mentioning? It's fine. Okay, so I haven't, I haven't, it's been a long time since I worked it out exactly, but if you imagine there's a low pass filter first in the band of interest, okay, and then you do the down conversion, you can show carefully that the noise statistics won't change. There'll be a factor change, but you're going from real to complex, so you expect a, a change by a factor. So we'll, maybe we'll do this more rigorously later, but for now at least the x to y I did it, I did it rigorously, right? From x, vector x to vector y, we know how the statistics change. The statistics for RAB tilde of T are not clear. The plus N, N tilde of T, you want to know what the statistics for N tilde is. Okay, maybe I'll make that a nice uh, quiz question or a tutorial question. We can do that. It's not a difficult thing to figure out. But after the correlation, we know exactly what the statistics is. Y is equal to X plus N and X, N will be IID Gaussian. I know, I know that very exactly. There's no problem there. But I didn't do the down conversion statistic carefully. It's possible. Particularly if you assume a low pass filter, you can see why it should be proper. Okay. Anything else? But that is an important problem. The noise statistics at the complex baseband level. What is the continuous time random process? That, that's an interesting problem. Anything else? It's okay. All right. So, 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 so before I move on, so the next thing is going to be about detection, and it is it's a little bit more mathematical than what we have seen. Okay. So once you come to the detector level, it becomes a fairly mathematical problem. But before before we go there, I want to I want to throw up something to you, so something to think about. Okay, so if, if enough of you are interested, it'll take at least a team of three, and uh, you have to come and convince me that you are sufficiently interested and you have all the tools necessary. I'm okay with having a building such a thing as a project. Okay, so you can do it at different levels. For instance, you can, if you have the skills for doing layout, PCB layouts, you can get it built. I can, I can get you money for that. There's no problem. But you have to have at least two or three people. It's not a one-person job. It's very difficult to make it a one-person job. And you have to convince me that you have enough different skills there. So somebody who can do soldering and populating a PCB, etc. I mean, all these things should be there. If you have enough things, then I'm okay with trying to build a, a modem, if you will, for a M squared to AM. Okay. So build a transmitter and receiver. Nothing fancy. Just the basic, uh, basic transmitter and receiver. Okay. And show that it works. Of course, you have to show that it works. Yeah, and I'm willing to re give you credit for that instead of your final exam, etc., etc. Ultimately, this is what you're supposed to do, right? 
this is the point of this whole course there are so many other things also you'll see later on but at least the physical building of it but like i said there should be two or three people in the team and you have to come and convince me that you're really willing to do it and you have enough skills to do it and if you have like five courses which are intense don't try it it's be just a waste of time if you have enough time on your hands and you want to build it just for fun you can try it and i'm willing to finance it also but you should show me first that you're interested okay so that's uh, one part that i want to throw so let's proceed to the detection problem okay so 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 yeah so so before before i proceed just one quick note okay suppose i do mpam in this system okay instead of m squared qam i can still do a very similar thing except that my xab tilde of t now will be real okay right will be real so in base band i will be occupying my positive bandwidth will be exactly equal to the negative bandwidth so if you imagine 0 to w available in base band, minus w to w available in base band 0 to w will be exactly the same as minus w to 0 now if i shift to pass band what will happen around f0 also i'll have the same symmetry and i'll be wasting half my bandwidth but if i do m squared qam what happens in base band i don't have symmetry because of the complex nature minus w to 0 is not the same as 0 to w but if i shift it to pass band what happens overall about 0 i have symmetry but about f0 i won't have symmetry still but i'll be using the entire bandwidth okay so that is the difference also which i want want you to keep in mind okay so that's something i didn't uh, talk too much about okay so let's now move on to the detection problem okay so this will kind of complete the whole design you can do a nice basic design okay so i'm going to remind you of the model and the notation what's my model now so once i do once i'm down to the detection problem my model is completely a vector model y equals x plus n okay each of these guys are say m dimensional vectors okay this came from the dimension of my gram smith process right if i do that how many dimensions i get okay so on top of that what else do i know okay i'm given the okay i'm writing fx of x but this is actually a probability mass function right i'm expecting capital x to be a discrete random vector okay so this is given to me okay typically i'll make the assumption that all the x's are equally likely okay so the alphabet on which this x is take a value or the constellation i will denote by this uh, curvy x okay so this is my uh, signal constellation okay so i don't have to put a bar down below it's just a set okay so this x is a what x is a set of m dimensional vectors right so that's how i'm thinking about it okay so that's my signal constellation and what is my noise statistic okay i'll assume it's it's given and uh, once again it's an m dimensional pdf okay typically it will be continuous okay so i, I i'm i'll uh, i'll think of x being discrete and the noise being continuous okay so it's all real now i can do this with the real thing itself i don't have to worry about complex and all that it's just a convenience right so real also is exactly the same thing it's all real it's no complex stuff going on okay another assumption that one can make is x and n are independent right so there's no no reason why this is dependent okay so once you give all this you can find the pdf for y the conditional pdf of y given x join pdf for y and x you can find all these things okay there's no problem okay but some things will be not very clearly defined what do i mean by join pdf of y and x x is discrete y is continuous right so maybe you use some deltas here and there to define these things okay it's possible to do that so once again one can do all of those things okay so that's the statistic okay that's the model so what is my problem my problem is given y what is my best estimate for x okay so that's my problem given that i observe a vector y what is the i'll use a carefully chosen word here i'll say optimal uh choice for x 
okay so i have to define what i mean by optimal so optimal is typically you have some objective function and you either minimize or maximize it so that's when you say that i have chosen my independent variable optimally okay so i'll have to pick my objective function and say i'm trying to minimize it or maximize it and say i'll pick my x in that fashion that's that's the that's the nature for the optimal so to do this properly so let me write down the model once again i'm adding n to it i get y i run a detector on it to get x hat okay so this is my picture okay i'm trying to design x hat what is x hat now x hat is the output of the detector is one way of looking at it but mathematically if you look at it it is some function of y okay so that's the way you define x hat so x hat is a function of y okay remember all these guys are random variables so i can think of a joint distribution for x and n joint distribution for x and y a joint distribution for even x and x hat okay x hat is what just a function of y so you should be able to find the pdf for that also in fact x hat will be also a discrete function okay so because it will take values in x hat will take values in this signal constellation so this will x hat will also be discrete so i can think of all kinds of joint pdfs so any probability any event defined using any of these combinations of random variables i should be able to find probability for using my joint pdfs and pmfs and conditional pdfs and pmfs okay so my objective function will be a probability okay so what what do i want to write down as my objective function my objective function what what is the most logical objective function you can have what can you try to maximize or minimize probability that x hat equals x you might want to maximize okay so that's a nice nice thing to try okay so that's my objective function which is probability of correct decision i'll denote it p of c this is the probability that x hat equals x okay so that's my probability so given a joint pdf for x and x hat okay how will i find the joint pdf for x and x hat if i define the detector's function detector is a function from y to function of y which is x hat i know the joint pdf of x and y once i define the function i can find the joint pdf of x and x hat so at the theoretical level all these things are very well defined it's no problem okay in practice you'll have to compute it and you can use a lot a lot of tricks to easily compute it you'll see it's not a very difficult computation but in theory it's all very well defined so it's an event it's a proper event on the pro joint pro joint distribution and you can compute its probability it's no problem okay so let's try to now simplify uh, this expression and simplify it simplify it simplify it so on till we get to a very meaningful optimization problem where i can find my detector function easily okay so remember i i have to pick my function of y suitably so that this guy is minimal okay so over all possible functions which is that function which gives me the minimal probability or maximal probability for this correct decision okay so that's what i want want to do so i'll try to look at this objective function change it change it so that i come to a point where my choice becomes very obvious okay so that's what i'm going to do and it might have some non trivial steps in the middle hopefully we'll we'll try to see it okay so let's try to write it down so the first thing i'm going to do is to say okay so so let me write it so so x hat is actually a function of y okay so and so i have to bring y into the picture right so i have to so the nice thing i can define is a joint pdf for x y and x hat and then do the evaluation on that so i have to bring y into the picture the way i'm going to bring y into the picture is like this since y is continuous i'm going to write down integration probability of this event conditioned on y being equal to y then fyy dy okay i can do this by dy i mean dy1 dy2 dym okay so i can do this so so this is nice okay so another reason why this is nice this expression is nice is at the detector you are given y okay so you are given y and you have to choose x hat based on y so this kind of captures that computation also the computation you have to do at the detector is also compute captured nicely by this probability okay so now now we have to think more about this expression okay and figure out what we have to try to maximize
okay so i want to maximize this entire integral but i notice for each y f y of y is positive okay so it's enough if i maximize this probability for each y then i would have maximized my probability of correct decision so you see i'm moving from a complicated maximization to simpler maximizations okay instead of maximizing the entire p of c it's enough if i maximize this conditional probability for a particular y for each y I have to figure out how to maximize it for each y. Once I figure out how to maximize it for each y, then I can define my x hat suitably and, I, and that will end up maximizing my correct decision probability as well. So that, let me write that down. Maximizing P of C is equivalent to maximizing probability that x hat equal to x given y equals y for each y. Okay, so remember... I have to define x hat as a function of y, which means I have to define x hat for each y. Okay, I have to tell you for each y how you find x hat. So this is also nice that way. Okay, if I have to maximize this for each y, I'm pretty much telling you what the de detector should do for each y. So it, it kind of has a logical way of moving towards the problem and its solution. So it's very nice. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's try to write that down. Okay. So what do I mean by this maximization? For a given y, for each y, we pick, okay, this maximization means this, we pick x hat such that, such that, what? Probability of x hat equals x given y equals y is maximized. And this is the optimal choice for x hat. Okay, so I'm going to write this thing down in a nice uh, mathematical sounding way, which will, which probably will be more pleasing for people, and it's easy to remember this. So I'm going to write x hat equals argument of maximization over x probability that x equals x given y equals y. Okay, what am I doing on in this in this uh, subtle way of writing the whole maximization? I choose different values for x hat. I put x hat equals x1, x2, x3, so on, and then I evaluate that probability on the right. Probability that capital X equals small x given y equals y, and then I pick that x hat for which this probability is maximal, and that has to be the way in which you have to choose your x hat. Okay, this argument is basically telling me I don't want the objective function, but I want the variable that maximizes the objective function. So this is a very nice and neat way of writing it down. So this x equals x, if this is disturbing, you just do a ulta and write capital X equals small x. Okay, so your free variable is small x now. Okay, so this x belongs to what? The signal constellation. Okay, over all x in the signal constellation, you keep evaluating this probability. Okay. And then you pick that x for which you have a maximum probability and that will end up doing it. Okay, so no, notice now this probability is much easier to evaluate because you now want the PDF of what? Simply x and y. You want the conditional PDF of x given y and that's something that you're very comfortable with. Okay, so slowly from this x hat, we have managed to slowly figure out uh, to a point where we are much more comfortable dealing with the PDFs that are involved. Okay. Right, so this rule is called the MAP rule. What is MAP? Maximum a posteriori rule. Okay, so and this is the optimal rule for detection. Okay. Notice here, I have made no assumption. I have not even assumed y equals x plus n. Okay, this is just n has not even entered the picture so far. What is this purely? X and y have a joint distribution. That's the only thing I care about. So this detection problem, solution to the detection problem can be applied in a wide variety of ways. Okay. In so many different applications, it's actually used. Anytime you have a joint distribution between two random variables and you can observe one and you have to find the optimal value for the other, you can use this MAP. Okay. The only additional thing is I've assumed X is discrete here. But it's maybe the, even that assumption can be relaxed. It's not a big deal. Okay. You can do that. Okay. So this is the detection problem. Now I'll slowly specialize, start specializing it to our 
AWGN type assumption and then you will see the answer will be very very easy finally. Okay, so we will start doing that. Okay, one thing that is disturbing about this uh, conditional PDF is you are given y and then you are doing x. Okay, but what seems to be natural is given y given x. Okay, but you can go from this to that using base rule. Okay, so use base rule and let us see how to change that. Okay, so once you start using base rule, you see probability that x equals x given y equals y okay, can be written as okay, remember I will do a subtle change between pdf whenever necessary. Okay. So, I can write it as f y given x y given x times probability of x equals x divided by f y y. Okay, I will write it this way. Okay. Right? So, this is something very simple. Now, if I do maximization over all small x on the left, I can do the same maximization over all small x on the right. But notice the denominator is independent of small x. There is no small x there. Okay? So, I can say my MAP rule is equivalent to maximizing over x in this x probability that x equals x times an x. Okay, so this is one thing. Okay, this is the MAP rule. Okay. In many cases of interest, the first term might also be independent of x. Okay, it might be constant. Okay, it might be uniform. But it's uh, it, it's, it's really not true in practice in several communication scenarios. Okay, so I've always been saying that you pick all these bits independently, independently, independently. In digital communication today, you use a powerful technique called error control coding, which makes all these bits dependent. Okay, so you have to actually do something else at this point. We'll come back to it later, but remember that this assumption we are going to say is valid now. We're going to say it's uniform, and I'm going to throw it away. But in many cases, it won't be true. You'll have to come back and fix it. Okay, so based on our assumption, we can throw it out. Okay, suppose you see this is uniform, then the MAP rule becomes what's called the ML rule. Okay, so the maximum likelihood rule. Okay, so okay, maybe I should write down what these things are. Maximum a posteriori. This is maximum likelihood. Okay, what is this rule? X hat equals argument of maximization over X in the constellation F Y given X Y given X. Okay, by itself it is a detection method. People say I am doing ML. Okay, I do not care whether the probability is uniform or not. I will still do ML. Okay, it is a detection method which will be suboptimal to MAP in the what condition? If the x's are not uniform, it will be suboptimal. Okay, otherwise it will be good. Okay, so it's, it's a reasonably good detection method as well. That's the ML rule. Okay, so once again, I've not used anything about n so far. I'm not. So these are all general things that you can use for any detection problem. MAP and ML are general techniques that can be used. Okay, so now we'll throw in the y equals x plus n assumption and try to simplify the the this conditional PDF in that case and you will see finally for the AWGN it will work out to a very very simple uh, situation. Okay, So, for AWGN we have y equals x plus n. So, so this f y given x of y given x becomes what? Okay, So, it is going to be normal centered at x and with variance same as the variance of n naught. Okay, so another way of writing it is f n of y minus x. Okay, so it's the same thing. So you take the distribution for n instead of its mean, which is zero, you put x as the mean. Okay, so roughly this is the way of writing it. So in fact, to be very rigorous, what will the expression be? One by root pi n naught, right, to the power m e power minus what norm y minus x squared divided by did I mix out a root 
I'm sorry, n naught. Okay, is that fine? Everybody is happy. So this will be the exact expression for my conditional PDF. Okay. So over all choices for x, I have to maximize this probability. Okay. So remember what I have e power minus positive number showing up. So if I want to maximize e power minus something, I should minimize whatever that something is. Okay. So my ML rule in AWGN becomes equivalent to what? X hat equals argument of minimization over all x in x. What? Norm y minus x square. So this could be termed as the minimum distance decoder or the nearest neighbor decoder. Okay, I'll say nearest. Uh, nearest uh, whatever nearest uh, neighbor is a weird thing so I'll say maybe I'll say closest what shall we call it closest symbol decoder or some such thing okay I'll call it the closest symbol decoder uh, this is the best way of putting it right why is it the closest symbol you look at the received constellation right why is some point how do you go to the x find the nearest x in Euclidean distance okay that's the rule it's really really simple and that happens to be optimal under what assumption? All the signal points are equally likely. That's optimal. In AWG, in AWG, that's optimal. Okay, so it's a very, very simple rule. There's no big uh, problem here. So, and we can do a whole bunch of examples, then uh, figure out how this uh, how this works out. Okay. So I'll do one example maybe, and then we'll wind up for today. The example will be: Do you want to do a complicated example or a simple example? We'll do BPSK for now, which is not even an example. I think all of you know how BPSK is going to work out. Okay, the first example we'll see is BPSK. What will it be? Okay, so so it's very common to denote the detector by drawing the received signal constellation and saying for each point what will be my corresponding x hat. See, I have to define x hat as a function of y. So basically I have to define a function of y. Then I define my detector. So how do you define the function of y? You write the axis where y can be. So this is my axis y. On y I have my transmitted points x. Okay. So one is minus one, the other is plus one corresponding to say bit zero and bit one. Okay. This is my constellation. But my y can be any point on this axis. So if it's a point on, on the right side, right side of zero, then I'm going to say my transmitted point is plus 1 because for any point on the right side of 0 what will be the closest signal point plus 1 okay so that's easy to see and any point on the left side of 0 the closest signal point will be minus 1 okay so usually you drew you draw something like a region here draw this and say anything here x hat is going to be plus 1 anything here x hat is going to be minus 1 okay so that's it. That's my simple uh, BPSK detect. So now you can take any of your other signal constellation pictures and then mark out the regions where you will make different decisions. Right? If you take for instance m square QAM, y can, y can be any point on the signal constellation. X is supposed to be a set of points and then y can be any point on the signal constellation. For each point you have a nearest closest symbol that was transmitted. So you can map out the entire signal constellation into regions where, into what are called decision regions. Okay, there is a region within which my decision is going to be a particular transmitted symbol. So those are decision regions. So in a sense, the, all the examples are basically plotting decision regions for your detector. So we'll do that in the next class for all the other examples. And you'll see it's quite easy. And then we can in fact even compute probability of error and then start studying the trade-offs more closely. Okay, so we'll do that next time.